On January 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler, Führer of the Nazi Party, walks out of the offices of German President Paul von Hindenburg with tears in his eyes. He is greeted by a small crowd cheering and saluting him with the Hitler salute. When he gets in his car, he repeats, we did it, we did it. Against all democratic principles, he has been appointed Chancellor of the German Reich. It is the beginning of the downfall of Germany and a prelude to tens of millions of deaths. Welcome to Between Two Wars, a chronological summary of the interwar years, covering all facets of life, the uncertainty, hedonism, and euphoria, and ultimately humanity's descent into the darkness of the Second World War. I'm Indy Nidell. In our previous episode about German elections, we left things off as Germany had once again managed to elect a parliament incapable of selecting a government with majority support. Parts of the electorate had abandoned traditional parties for the communists on the extreme left and the Nazis on the outer right. Chancellor Franz von Papen of the conservative Zentrum Party had convinced President Hindenburg to issue an emergency decree making Papen dictator of Prussia. Hitler had snubbed Papen's attempt to forge a Nazi conservative coalition. And finally, in a showdown with the Reichstag, Hindenburg and Papen dissolved parliament and called for new elections on November 4th. Exciting stuff. While that election campaign starts, Papen remains chancellor by emergency decree and continues to court the NSDAP, the Nazis, for a coalition. His Nazi counterpart and ally Gregor Strasser was one of the first Nazi members of parliament and is now Reichsorganisationsleiter, general secretary of the party, the second most powerful Nazi after Adolf Hitler. Strasser is also one of the last members of the left NSDAP still in the party leadership. In the early days of the party, together with his brother Otto, he had led a faction with outspoken anti-bourgeois, left-leaning sympathies. In 1925, he even challenged Hitler's leadership over ideas about proposing Soviet-style land reforms. But Hitler, with support of the ultra-reactionary party right-wing, defeats Strasser in a public showdown at the party leadership summit at Bamberg in 1926. Hitler rails against the leftists, nailing them national Bolsheviken and decrying them as traitors to the Nazi cause. Strasser backs down, and it is here that Hitler gets confirmed as the absolute leader of the party, the Führer. Despite Strasser's loss, though, and that his leftist economic views have no real effect on the party anymore, he is appointed Reich's propaganda leiter, head of propaganda. Together with his apprentice, Joseph Goebbels, he now continues the campaign that will make the Nazis a real force in German politics. Now, Goebbels had, by his own account, already abandoned any sympathy for the left during the Bamberg showdown. But he bridges Strasser's economic leftism and Hitler's ultra-racist positions by converging them around anti-Semitism, where their views are already aligned anyway. Goebbels and Strasser now perfect the Nazi, racist, anti-Semitic newspeak, where socialism means solidarity with the German race. Bolshevik is synonymous with Jew. Bourgeois indicates Jewish middle class. Banker is a Jew. Capitalism is the Jewish conspiracy of international finance, and so on. The issue is not a new one in this, the National Socialist German Workers' Party. And yet, Hitler opposes continued socialist-sounding rhetoric at first, but Goebbels convinces him to play along. Not only is this instrumental, in making the NSDAP acceptable to former socialists with nationalist sympathies, but it also saves Strasser from Hitler's ire. And it is a success, attracting huge amounts of violent socialist militants and activists dissatisfied with the floundering Communist Party. Between 1925 and 1930, NSDAP membership grows from 26,000 to 389,000. In May 1929, Strasser loses, but survives, yet another showdown with Hitler, when Strasser dares to propose entertaining the idea of a coalition with the Social Democrats, or even the Communists, for a state government in Saxony. This episode also marks a final break with Goebbels, now his successor as head of propaganda. But despite the infighting, between 1928 and 1930, Strasser advances his position and rebuilds the party into a model of efficiency. He introduces a structure 
closely mirroring the provincial structure of Germany, with Gauleiters instead of provincial governors, and the Sturmabteilung, or SA, structured like the state and federal police. He appoints Reichsleiters to handle a state-like administration, and restructures the party leadership like a, like a shadow cabinet of the chancellery. By 1932, the NSDAP is a complete state within the state, poised and ready to pounce for takeover of the country. For that, Adolf Hitler has two plans. A. Hitler wins the presidency and appoints Strasser Chancellor. B. Hitler does not win the presidency and they demand that Hitler is appointed Chancellor. Strasser considers both ideas unrealistic and he has only one plan enter into a coalition with the conservatives and settle for key cabinet positions. When plan A falls through, he takes this to Papen without informing Hitler. But already before the July elections, Hitler finds this out from British journalist Sefton Delmer and once again blows a gasket at Strasser. The rest of the leadership calm Hitler down enough to not make a public scene and to pay lip service to Strasser's and Papen's agreement. With the parliament seats gained in July, Hitler stays the course and snubs Papen. Strasser, though, is less optimistic about the November elections and continues negotiations with Papen as the new election campaign starts. Now, street violence coming mostly from the Nazis against the communists was the central theme of the July election. This election campaign, we see the communists go after the Social Democrats. For Ernst Tellmann, leader of the Communist Party, the KPD, has smelled blood. In July, the new votes he captured came almost exclusively at the expense of the center-left Social Democrats, SPD. And if you found a winning formula, why not roll with it? Well, that is what he does. Their main slogan is still that they are the only genuine anti-fascist alternative, but now they add the SPD to this list of fascists by labeling them social fascists. The SPD themselves position social democracy as the alternative to everything, against von Papen, against the Nazis, against the communists. The Nazis, on Goebbels' orders, had toned down the anti-Semitic rhetoric in 1930 and in July, but now it creeps back into their main campaign focus. And the patchwork of conservative parties, including Centrum and the German National People's Party, DNVP, run on an identity campaign to return Germany to an imagined glorious past. And while they all rail away against each other, something essential happens in the background. The economy starts to recover. Not overnight, it's been in recovery for many months, but now people begin to notice it in their wallets and on the job market. It's a combination of Papen's repeal of several of the draconian austerity measures set by his predecessor and the early effects of overall European recovery from the 1929 October crash. Moreover, many of the briefly canceled social security programs, part of German welfare capitalism, have been reintroduced. Together, it leads to a lesser sense of financial urgency, which coupled with exhaustion over the constant elections suppresses voter turnout, which sinks from 84.1% in July to 80.6% in November. On election day, the biggest losers are actually the Nazis. But the Social Democrats also take a beating, an essential beating. The NSDAP loses 34 seats down to 196, but it's still the biggest party. Papen's conservative bloc combined gains 16 seats to 154, or 26.3%, making them the second biggest faction behind the Nazis. The moderate and liberal centrist parties are now wholly insignificant, but the change on the left has dramatic effects. The SPD lose 12 seats. Out of those, 11 go to the KPD, the Communists. So, even with the NSDAP losses, 50.7% of votes in the Reichstag are either for Communists or Nazis. This means that nothing has changed. Those extremists on both ends can still block the formation of any government by merely abstaining from voting. And it was so close. If the communists had taken only four fewer seats from SPD, a new grand coalition would have been possible. But now, even if a coalition of SPD and KPD was ideologically possible, which it isn't, they don't have the votes for that either. Instead, the only alternatives 
are yet another election or a coalition of conservatives and Nazis, right? Well, now with the losses of the NSDAP and the improving economy, Papen comes up with another plan. He will take charge of the country as dictator of Germany. Now, Papen and his minister of the interior, Wilhelm Baron von Geil, advise Hindenburg to prorogue the Reichstag for six months and only then hold new elections. In that time, they will devise a new constitution. It is his old plan of a return to constitutional monarchy. New elections in the spring should give them time to build a sufficient base to get this through the new Reichstag. Hindenburg likes the idea, but before they can even start putting it into play, they meet resistance. The execution of the plan depends on having the Reichswehr, the army, on their side. But Reichswehr Minister Kurt von Schleicher has some serious concerns with this plan. During the only major violent clash between police, communists, and Nazis in the November election campaign, one of his confidants, Eugen Ott, was playing war games and coming up with disaster scenarios. According to Ott, the Reichswehr is in no position to resist the Nazi paramilitaries without launching a civil war. His scenarios predict that the communists would build a third front and in various versions of the events that then unfold, Ott foresees doom, such as invasion by Poland, intervention by the USSR, a secession of Bavaria as a Nazi state, occupation by the Western Allies, and several other effects that lead to the end of Germany. Not a single scenario foresees a successful outcome for the Reichswehr. To put it bluntly, combined, the NSDAP and KPD armed forces are now in many ways superior to the better equipped German armed forces. So Schleicher suggests another plan. Appease the Nazis and appease the communists and use Strasser to break up the NSDAP from within. It's an old idea called Kerfront, in English the third position, that supporters of a conservative revolution have toyed with for over a decade. Okay, in basic terms, it combines the reactionary social positions of the extreme right with some collectivist, labor-friendly fiscal policy of the radical left. Sound familiar? You got it. It's the Strasser position. Now, for the conservative mainstream, this has been an unacceptable idea until now. But under the dreadful prospects of the Ott scenarios, most of the conservative cabinet backs Schleicher's plan. Unsurprisingly, Strasser is also all for it. Somewhat surprisingly, he also indicates that he will have no problem getting Hitler and the rest of the NSDAP behind it as well. On December 3rd, 1932, Hindenburg dismisses Papen and makes Schleicher new Chancellor of Germany and dictator of Prussia by emergency decree. Meanwhile, Strasser takes the proposal for a coalition with Hitler as deputy chancellor to the rest of the Nazi leadership. This time Hitler does not explode. The election losses have left him a bit more cautious. Instead, Strasser meets immediate opposition from Reichstag President Hermann Goering and from Joseph Goebbels, who favor an all or nothing approach. Now, Hitler has spent the last few weeks in meetings with industrialists and bankers, working tirelessly to convince and assure them that they have no socialist measures to fear from the National Socialists. Then, his new industrialist and banker friends have been putting pressure on Hindenburg to accept Hitler even as chancellor, but they've also impressed on Hitler the need for diplomacy. While the NSDAP leaders argue, Schleicher starts making known his intent for a third front through a broad coalition. Not only is this met with skepticism by the general public, but it also infuriates conservatives who deride him as the Red General. Hitler fumes with anger when he realizes that he's been played. On the fifth day of the crisis, Strasser is forced to resign from his positions in the party. Schleicher's third position has failed before he even gets a chance to try it. For Hitler, it is now all or nothing, him or Schleicher, chancellor or bust. And the general public in Germany goes to celebrate Christmas and New Year's Eve with a false sense of relief. The economy continues to make public signs of recovery with spending and employment during the holiday season above expectations. The communists are relieved that the Nazis didn't make a government 
who are relieved that the communists didn't form part of the government. To the majority, it looks like a defeat for both extremes, especially Hitler, whom the media now portrays as a loser, relegated back to just a provincial Bavarian troublemaker. For Schleicher, it's nothing short of disaster. He has no mandate, no coalition partners, no plan, but he does have enemies. Papen and Schleicher have been close friends and allies for many years. But in only a few days, they have now become bitter enemies, and this will have consequences for the whole world. To salvage public support, Schleicher now publicly and repeatedly attacks the unpopular Papen, which he had promised Hindenburg he would not do. So not only is the principled old man in the presidential palace, Hindenburg, angered, he sees this as destructive to the chances of forming any government at all. On January 4th, 1933, Papen meets Hitler in secret in Cologne at a prominent banker's house. The topic is how to overthrow Schleicher. Papen's suggestion is the old one, a new government with himself as chancellor and Hitler as deputy, but now on equal footing. Hitler is agreeable in general, but evasive on the chancellor issue. The meeting leaks to the press, framed as an attempt to form a majority government finally, one with the Nazis, but under conservative oversight. A panicked Schleicher rushes to Hindenburg, demanding him to charge Papen with treason by presidential executive order. Hindenburg declines. On January 9th, Papen meets in secret with Hindenburg and proposes a government with Hitler in some form, but not as chancellor. On January 22nd, Hitler and Papen meet at Joachim von Ribbentrop's home in Berlin in yet another secret meeting. Von Ribbentrop, as many of you know, will one day be Nazi Germany's foreign minister. Goering and Goebbels are there, as well as Hindenburg's confidants Otto Meissner and Oskar von Hindenburg, the president's son, they attend too. They negotiate a compromise. Hitler as chancellor, Papen deputy chancellor and governor of Prussia, and Goering minister of the interior of Prussia. Meanwhile, Schleicher rushes to Hindenburg again, demanding that he dissolve the Reichstag, declare a state of emergency, and suspend elections indefinitely. Hindenburg declines, and when the attempted coup leaks to the press, Schleicher faces outrage and loud public calls for his immediate dismissal. Oskar von Hindenburg and Meissner now start convincing the president to go along with Hitler and Papen's plan. On January 28th, Schleicher makes a last-ditch attempt to persuade Hindenburg to at least prorogue the Reichstag, let him govern for now, and announce new elections. Hindenburg refuses again. Schleicher hands in his resignation. The same day, Papen meets Hindenburg and assures him that they have Hitler boxed in, and the tired old general agrees with the proposal. The next day, Papen and Hitler meet, and Hitler informs Papen of the real plan, announce elections for March, ensure that those elections are a landslide for the Nazis by whatever means. Then, they will enact an enabling law giving Hitler dictatorial powers. Papen will later claim that Hitler's words left him shaken to the core, but that it was too late. On January 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler is formally appointed Chancellor of the German Reich by presidential executive order. Gregor Strasser, now a private citizen, reportedly evaluates the development like this to a friend. Dr. Martin, I am a man marked by death. We shall not be able to go on seeing each other for long, and in your own interest, I suggest you do not come here anymore. Whatever happens, mark what I say. From now on, Germany is in the hands of an Austrian who is a congenital liar, a former officer who is a pervert, and a clubfoot. And I tell you, the last is the worst of them all. This is Satan in human form. He is referring to Hitler, Goering, and Goebbels in that order. Perhaps, ironically, it is with the organization that Strasser has built that the three will proceed to seize totalitarian power. See, Franz von Papen is the one who's boxed in. He might control large parts of the German administration, but remember, Strasser built the Nazi party as a state within the state a powerful organization that now quickly reaches its tentacles into all aspects of governance. Even as dictator of Prussia, Papen is powerless. 
Goering is now Prussian Minister of the Interior, with full control of the Prussian police and administration. Within days, the Prussian state is fully controlled by the SA. Goering formalizes the NSDAP intelligence efforts as the Geheime Staatspolizei, Gestapo, who proceed to infiltrate every aspect of Prussian public life. Meanwhile, Hitler and Goebbels start setting up the Gauleiters to do the same in all of the German provinces. As the election campaign for the March elections gets underway, the NSDAP unleashes violence, voter suppression and terror on a scale that widely surpasses any previous election unrest. On the night of February 28, though, a Dutch communist sets fire to the Reichstag to protest against the Nazis. The next day, Hindenburg signs the Reichstag Fire Decree, or Decree of the Reich President for the Protection of People and State, enabling Hitler to suspend law and order to pursue, ostensibly, political enemies of the state. In reality, it just makes the already ongoing activities of the party less cumbersome. Now the Prussian police, the SA and Hitler's bodyguard, the Schutzstaffel or SS, arrest thousands of KPD members, social democrats and liberals, many of them on the ballot, to systematically jail, beat, torture, and sometimes murder them. Gauleiters, the SA and SS set up improvised internment camps all across the country. This is the beginning of the concentration camp system. Political rallies of the social democrats and communists are attacked and dispersed. On election day, 50,000 SA and SS come out to patrol the polling booths to safeguard the elections. Still, despite this massive voter intimidation and manipulation campaign, more than 30% of the people still dare to vote for the communists or social democrats. On March 24th, the new Reichstag passes the Enabling Act, and Hitler is, for all practical purposes, dictator of Germany. It's an event that is sometimes analyzed as if it could have stopped the Nazis. Many of the SPD deputies and all of the KPD deputies were not even there. They were in concentration camps. Lining the walls of the plenary hall of the Reichstag were hundreds of uniformed, armed SA men. It was not the beginning of the Nazi power grab, but merely a ceremonial end. 13 years earlier, Social Democrat, liberal and conservative politicians of Germany had united around the idea of a free, tolerant and open democracy. Faced with extremists on the right and the left, they had appeased one side to beat down the other. They had tried to win their votes by themselves embracing conspiracy theories and populist positions. Ideas they knew were false anti-democratic and not even workable solutions. Willingly or unwillingly, they had moved closer and closer to extremism themselves. They were now reaping the poisonous fruits that they had planted. Fruits that will now kill many of them together with the tens of millions of innocent people that they, the pillar of German democracy, had on this day condemned to death. We've created a playlist for you of all of the episodes we've done on Hitler's rise to power. It will be right here any moment now. Our Time Ghost Army member for this episode is Omar Gallardo. It's thanks to Omar and the rest of the Time Ghost Army members' contributions that we can continue shining a light on these events. And as Martin Luther King said, let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. Cheers. Stay safe. Mm -hmm.